you literally just said, oh, I put myself in places I didn't belong, but you did belong because you were there. It's the story you told yourself for right. a little moment that someone else has a better ass, so they belong more than you do. Right. Like, But that's just a story. Right. And also, like, in life, it's never the most talented or the prettiest or the or the smartest that wins. It's the people that, like, really, like, work really hard. It's really about putting in the hard work, not giving up, learning the skill of resilience. When you fall, get right back up, dust yourself off, try again and again and again. Mm. And so I mastered this thing that I talk about, which is this 10% target. So my like, all of this comes down to this big mindset shift, which is make 10 attempts at whatever you want most. And you may not get to that goal, but by doing that process, another opportunity will present itself that you never even knew existed because mm. nobody makes 10 attempts. Mostly nobody even makes one attempt. So if you're someone who's making two or three or four, your, your chances of success are so much higher than anybody else's. Hi, my name is Aggie and this is Biohacking Bestie. the one-stop shop for a modern queen where you can find biohacking courses, self-growth courses, and where you can find the most incredible community of women so you can hit all of your biohacking goals and beyond. Hi, besties. How are you? My name is Aggie and you are listening to Biohacking Best. You're watching. If this, you're just on YouTube and you're just seeing us. Hello. My today's, today my Today, my today's guest, sorry, I just got way too excited, Jennifer <laughs> Cohen. Finally, we're meeting after years of, of n n being in each other's spheres on social Vortex. Media. Yes, yes. Index, vortex, that's a great word. Uh, your uh, soft cover, was it like uh, a... It's called, so it's basically called, um, well, it's hard cover and then paperback. Paperback, that's yeah. it. Bigger, better, bolder. Um, so congratulations, the book just came out. Thank you. And yeah, let's talk about how to live the life you want, shall we? Shall we? Yes, we shall. I mean, my book actually came out like 11 months ago in hardcover, and yeah. now this is the paperback edition or version. So yeah. The rebirth. It's a it. rebirth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm excited about it. And it's like the whole rigmarole again. You know, you've got to like do the whole... Uh, circuit of like getting people yeah. to know about it who haven't yet found out about it which is the hardest thing because you write a book and you're like oh, i'm done and then you're like no i now need to let people know about my book oh my <laughs> which god is like yeah. the next stage but my first question to you is you know you wrote it at least a year and a half ago oh god it came yeah. out like 11 months ago what would you write differently in the hindsight? that's a really good question you know what's funny um be you know what happens? You know when you start talking about what your overall message is, like how to be bold. Like to, for those of you who have no idea, so my message is boldness is a skill. It's a muscle that you can you can get better at. You can get stronger at. You don't have to be born that way. And asking for what you want. So most people just acquiesce to what's available versus chasing what they actually want. And mm -hmm. my whole thing is chase what you want, don't just accept what you get. And when you talk about that over and over again, because people ask you the same, like a lot of the same questions, obviously, about the book, you end up like thinking of other things that are um, ways to be bold or what also, if it's what, what else you need as these life skills to become successful. To me, Boldness is a life skill, mm -hmm. and it is more important to be bold than to be smart, to be successful in all areas of life. So not just in business, but in your personal life and everything. And then I start thinking, well, what other life skills are important as well? Or how do you, like, what is the precursor to being bold, right? So like, that's the thing that I've really been thinking about. Like, if you're not bold, Yes, I can give you all these principles of why being bold is important and how you can get better at it. But the, the, here are a few other things that I think are just as important that you need to master to really live the life that you want. Which is, I guess, all we want. But there's this idea, uh, just to reflect back what you said, is this idea that, like, I'm a shy person, you know, mm -hmm. as if you're born shy and it's like a part of your identity which is, I think shyness is a, a, is a learned behavior of either being, uh, either growing up in an environment that encouraged you to be small 
or just not being rewarded or celebrated for speaking up your mind. And, you know, oh, that's a good girl. Whenever you're sitting quietly, I'm like, oh, so if I'm quiet, I'm a good girl. And if I'm bold and I say I want this and that, it's just like, oh, you're, you're a bitch or whatever. Right. Or you're like aggressive mm-hmm. or you're brash or there's a lot of these negative connotations that come with the word bold. People automatically like create these like negative ways of oh, describing it, euphemisms for it. Uh, and I don't look at it that way. But I will say something about what you were saying, being shy. I do believe we all have a set personality, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I think that we're all innately born one one way or another to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. So like maybe your personality, you were born more shy than me and mm-hmm. I was born more bold than you, right? Yeah. Like our baseline's different. Maybe I'm uh, a five in, in bold and you're a one in bold when you were first yeah. born, right? Oh, I was a super shy or, child. Or a negative five for yeah. you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could not even like speak out loud with the, all these like family videos and I just hide behind my mom. I was like, I'm not speaking ever. To right. Stranger. Yeah. Right. And so like, and then based on your nurture, like how you were raised, then that just gets exemplified, right? So then that just gets exacerbated. So if you were naturally shy and that was encouraged, then you'd probably remain being shy or more timid, more meek. And if I was born more bold, let's uh, more bold, yeah. and that was kind of applauded, let's just say, then that I would be I would work that more, right? But what I was going to say is that whatever your baseline is when you were born, you could then do certain things to amplify that. So if like I said, if I was a five bold and you were a two bold, I may able, I might be able to get up to like an eight on that baseline, mm-hmm. right? You might be get maybe get up to like a five. So I'm not saying you're gonna be you're gonna end up being like this crazy bold person. But you can always improve where you were as a baseline by doing these simple things. And in what are those simple things? Well, I'll, I'll tell them to tell you. But <laughs> I, and I and the reason why I encourage it, I encourage it. It's because otherwise we tend to at, like acquiesce to what is available, and then other people choose our life for us. Oh, and which so, is so true, right? So if you don't make the decisions yourself, if you're not designing and curating exactly the life you want, you're leaving it open to the universe or to whoever's around you or to whatever's available or whatever is available. And then you're just make they're making the decision decisions for you. So wouldn't you rather take control and be kind of like the CEO or, you know, be an active participant in what and how you spend your time in your life? 100%. One hundred percent. I right. think it's just like it's uh, bringing that main character energy. I said that in my book. Like you need to bring that CEO, that main character energy into your life because someone else will make the decision about your life. And I always try to bring everything back to fitness and and wellness and biohacking and what does it mean for us and even taking bold decisions about your health and well being is is also like a really big big step in your health journey. One hundred. Well, I my, one of the major pillars. Um, and maybe that's why you and I connect and what I think is a major pillar in living a life, um, that you actually want and go after it and have the self-confidence and the self-esteem to do it is creating a pyramid and putting your physical fitness at the top of that pyramid, (laughs) right? Because if you do that and after that you put, let's say your mindset, your spiritual fitness, your business, Everything else will fall into place if you put your physical health, your physical fitness first. Because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. That's mm-hmm. the first part. Secondly, secondly, it helps build everything else. It's building blocks for everything else. The more confident and strong I feel physically, the stronger I feel mentally. And when I'm mentally tough, when I'm mentally strong, I feel much more confident to go after the things I want. When I feel shitty about myself, when I feel like I don't look great, I don't, I feel weak, I feel tired, I feel lethargic. Who the hell wants to feel? Whoever wants to go after stuff, they feel. That's when your self doubt really kicks in, and you're like, "Well, and I'm not works, good enough," you know? and it works. Yeah. But like, and not to mention all the different, the dopamine, the serotonin, the 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 endorphins you get from feeling physically fit when you're working out and exercising. It puts you on 
another plane altogether, mm-hmm. right? Like, right? Like when I feel that way, I feel unstoppable. I feel like, you know, Wonder Woman. I'm like, I can go after that. I can do that because you feel good. Yeah. So start with a, a, a building block that you can do. Anybody can do it. Like, doesn't matter. You don't have to be an Olympian. You can just be, a, you know, somebody who's just putting your physical health and physical fitness first by going for long walks or going for a walk or, or, or whatever that might be. And knowing that you did that for yourself, it's also a feeling of a sense of accomplishment. Like, you know, I did that for me. I did that. I followed through. Okay, on to the next thing. Let's keep it moving. So my big thing is that, pyra- that, that pyramid and getting that foundation down. I would never have had I've never, I would never have been this bold um, or have done 90% of the things if I didn't start taking my, my fitness, my physicality seriously and making that my number one mm. habit. Music to my ears. Right? Because it's literally what I really believe in. I had these grand ideas of what I want to do with my life. I got really sick and I absolutely did zero things. You know, mm. because I was just like, I can't do it. All I can think about is how bad I feel. And we know, you know, even Tony Robbins is like, you change your state, change your life. Like mm-hmm. if your state isn't healthy, there's no way you can do anything. And so a lot of women that I work with they think, okay, I'm, I'm low energy. This is part of, you know, or like, I don't have time to go to the gym. But for me, it's just like, gym is not even about, like, I understand that like, you have kids, you, you have a mm-hmm. job. And some people do get intimidated. But for me, Jim is like your promise. It's like a date, you know, one on one with myself. It's like my promise to my body. Like, what are we doing? Right. You know, it doesn't have to be anything extreme. You don't have to be Arnold, but you you do want to show up for yourself. You know, have a space. Absolutely. I think that fitness is a catalyst for everything else in your life. What about you? How was it like in your journey? But in which part? In terms of like... In terms of like, can you, was there a moment in your life as like little Jennifer that she basically didn't have fitness in her life? Yes. Or she felt okay. So I'll tell you how that happened for me. So Because it sounds like you talk from personal pain. Well, because yeah. I was a young kid. You know what it was? I, I tr- me, all my friends were, and me, we and I, we were trying up for like this dance company. And all my friends got in but me. I was the only <laughs> one who didn't get in. <sighs> That hurts. And it was so, here. yes, it was so heartbreaking. And I, I was devastated because. How old it, were you? I was probably like 14 or 15. Oh, wow. And we were, we were, we were, we were all dancing in this thing already together in this, in this, in this group. It was actually, it was like, it was called, um, I don't remember, it was called Ruach, I think. It was like an Israeli dancing group. And the next thing to try out for was this thing called Chai, which was another dancing group. And all of my friends got it, and all the people I would work, I was working with, and then I was the only one who didn't get it, and I felt really shitty about myself. Okay, say that on here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, I have no filter. Okay, and that's another thing we have in common. Okay, good, <laughs> <laughs> good. I've got zero filter, um, and they all got it, and I felt like really bad, and I was like, what am I gonna do now? Like, I, I, I really was, really down and I felt like really bad about myself. I was, I had a lot of, like then I had a lot of self-doubt because I'm like, I'm not good enough. I can't dance as well. You know, why, why, why me? And I felt really bad and victimized. So I, there was like a gym near my house and I'm like, you know, if they're going to be practicing the dancing, I guess I'll go and take like a step class or something like that. You know what I mean? Let me try it out. It was like a women's gym near my house. Mm -hmm. And I went and I love, I didn't love the class, but I loved how I felt after the class. Uh. Right. So like, I'm not saying I, I love the feeling afterwards. So then I got addicted to that feeling of how I felt after I worked out. The endorphins. Right. With the endorphins. It wasn't so much about the actual workout because I could take or leave that, but that's what motivated and drove me to go again and again and again. So smart. So you basically, instead of thinking like, oh, I need to go to the gym to do a workout. You're like, Oh, I need to go to the gym because I'm going to feel amazing after. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like, I don't really, I, I don't typically, what that taught me is I don't normally do things for how that thing feels in the moment. I usually think about how that affects me like over time after the fact. So if I get mired in, 
I don't feel like doing it now because motivation wanes, right? Like motivation, willpower, those are just things that go up and down, they ebb and flow. And if you mm. rely on those things to get you through things, you're not going to do very much. So how I kind of reframe that in my brain is how am I going to feel after I did do this thing? Because that to me will take me way further. So mm. I know that if I work out, the my endorphins will be sky, like, will be very high. I will feel better. I will feel that I accomplished something. I'll feel strong, which will then allow me to go and do this and go and do that and go and do this. And very that's smart. how I reframe in my head. So when I was young, I that that clicked quite early. And over time then I saw myself getting stronger and stronger and more fit and more fit. And my confidence was really then starting to really start to compound, right? Because I was getting compliments all the time. People were asking me what I was doing like at a, at a young age. And so that was just kind of putting gasoline on the fire for me. And then eventually that became my new normal where I became like the fitness girl, right? Really young. Yeah. And like I was doing all the classes. I then started to teach classes and I would, that's how I would make money when people were babysitting. I was like teaching, you know, aerobics or like step class or whatever it is. Right. So that became like, I, I quickly thought, Hmm, if I'm good at this. Let me see if I can monetize this really quickly. And look at you now. Well, look at me now, right now I'm like <laughs> an, an old goat, but I will say that was the beginning of something. And that got me to be very, that like helped me. I just say it didn't get me. It assisted me in the catalyst of really going after what I want and really being bolder. Mm. And then so many other things happen if, in my book. And like, it's just these little things. Like I try to like prepare myself or like set myself up for success. And I won't do anything that is of value unless I work out first before that thing, because I know I won't show up as well. Wow, so powerful. And I think I want to touch upon that, like one of the biggest things um, of like the difference between people that are super successful, the thought leaders in, in the world globally versus the ones that don't, they're really good at delayed gratification, mm -hmm. right? So like we're often like, oh, it feels so much nicer to sit on the couch now then feel great in two hours after the gym. So I choose what's good for me right now instead of seeing like, but I'll be so proud of myself in six months when I achieve X, Y, and Absolutely. Z. The gym. And it's like, it really is a muscle. 100. I think delayed gratification is one of these very underrated modalities that we need to kind of harness to be, to really. But it used to be a thing and it used to be like something that my parents, you know, growing up in Poland. Oh, right. Like almost 40 years ago, like this is like, this was a skill that we were, you know, like my parents would like try to like strengthen that muscle by like, you know, you have to wait for this and do a lot of things that like, you know, there was no TV, there was no like cell phones when we were younger. So it was pretty normal to be bored. To, right. to have that delayed gratification and all of a sudden now it's like you're posting a photo and within 10 minutes you have all these likes and comments and there's no like it's really hard to like I guess that's what's the beautiful thing about writing a book because that's like one of the few things with delayed gratification so easy to give up and that's why a lot of people don't even write the book right with anything in life right yeah. people start a lot of things in life and they don't finish or yeah. they go or, or they they have ideas and then they don't really execute like they what's that saying that they say right it's 99 percent um pr uh, no inspiration or one percent no one percent is inspiration 90 percent 99 is like perspiration because it's all about the execution and it's all about the fact that you That's need so to true. wait for things anything worth anything there is like a a process to it, right? There's no such thing as anything that's instant gratification is very fleeting, like Instagram. Like people now are much more, uh, are much, I guess they're, they're unable to even have like relationships, like interpersonal skills are really down. Loneliness is very high. It's like a very big epidemic yeah. because we are now relying on these like falsehoods of, uh, of, of dopamine, which is like a like or a comment on, on Instagram yeah, versus yeah. like having a really meaningful connection and conversation. Even to a podcast that's a little longer, right? Um, I, because you have 16 principles 
Am I correct? Yes. So which one is your favorite? Which one's like the biggest ask, one? Ask like ask, you know, my, which, my, which kid is my favorite? No. <laughs> uh, I think they all serve a per- I think all prince, all the principles serve a purpose. But I think a couple are really important. And one of them is I believe that naivety is a, str- uh, is a, major, is a major superpower. I think the less you know, the better. Which I saw that in the book. And I was like, that's a bold statement. Well, it's true, yeah, right? Yeah. We get, we get more, the, the older we get, that's why when people are, as we age, we tend to feel more jaded. We tend to do less because we think of all the possible things that can go wrong versus all the, uh, versus all the things that can go right. Right. Yes. And we lose that like fancy free, you know, let's try it. Let's go. Like as a child, we would, we would do that much more. And I believe that like if we can like allow ourselves to not know everything and know that's okay, we would get so much further in life, in everything. We would jump with both feet in relationships and in business and in yeah. so many other things. Like too much caution is is actually, I think it's actually a, a bad thing because mm-hmm. you limit yourself to like experiences and to relationships and to possibility. And so for me, I try to kind of, I try to act with, with some caution, but not over cautious. And, and there is a difference between, you know, being risk, I I guess I am much more risk tolerant, I guess, than others. But I believe like, that's how you find your best opportunities is when you kind of just jump in and do something without having all the answers. And then like, as you figure them, you know, you figure it out as you go versus having all of these like things that are stopping you and scaring you and, you know, making you overthink to a place where you have such analysis paralysis, you end up doing nothing exciting or different or unusual or unique. And you're living the same life every day, stagnant and bored because you are so scared to get out of your comfort zone. Mm. Oh, you're touching on so many beautiful things. Number one, like just this idea that we, as we get older, we get more scared. And I can definitely relate that every year there's this one thing that just makes you feel a little bit like, oh, like I have so much, almost like too much to lose. Yeah. Then second, I think that's just such a beautiful reframe. I You've worked with so many women, you know, I mean, you have massive, you know, half a million people like following and you probably, it's so interesting because I'm guessing that the book has been based on working with so many women closely, being on the DMs and the comments and realizing, wow, like one of the biggest things that's keeping women from achieving their fitness goals could be not being bold enough, right? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I have a lot, I have like a 50-50 split of men and women who follow me on Instagram. No way. Yeah, I have a 50-50 split. Maybe maybe like 50, maybe 52-48. Okay, I'm just like giving you like like, a lot of, like a a lot of them are because, because also it's about entrepreneurship. It's about like a lot of women and men, funnily enough, not only are they, they have people who take their business seriously or super successful in business tend to not always but more often than not are doing something in the fitness space that they are they are taking that seriously as well they're working out regularly they're like attempting a new sport they are trying to do things daily to keep them on point physically and mentally so i feel like there is like a definite cross pollination of that 100 percent, right 100 percent. i think if you're if you're taking yourself seriously your business is thriving your body is thriving your health is thriving well it's just a like, lot yeah. of type a personalities like a lot of alpha people yeah. right i mean not always there's always an exception to the rule but yeah. one of my main rules and i've written about this i talk about this is that like and we just said this earlier like a core a core skill not skill i think a foundational block that is very important that leads you to success is fitness, taking yourself, taking fitness seriously, making your physical health a priority. If you take your physical health as a priority, all these other things, like I said, fall into place. But people who are like these CEOs, who are these like entrepreneurs who are crushing it, more often than not, they are super fit. 
not always, but they are, they are, or they've reached a certain level of success. And now they're like, okay, shit, I'm not taking this. I can do this too. And they become much more animalistic in their fitness, in their fitness goals. But what I was going to say is the book really was not just about the people who follow me on Instagram. It was really about like my, my evolution. Cause when I got out, I did a Ted talk. And when I got asked to do a Ted talk, they asked me to do a Ted talk on like health, wellness, fitness, because the, the guy, the guy who was organizing the Ted talk, his girlfriend followed me actually on Instagram and read all of my fitness books. And so what I, he was saying to me, like, how did you have, like, he was like, I want, like, how did you become so successful in the fitness business or in the health space? Because what a lot of people don't realize is that really my success was much more on the other side. I started a lot of health and fitness brands and businesses, sold them. I was also a co-founder. I was an advisor and I became much more of like a fitness entrepreneur. I just use fitness and health as like the industry where I was doing a lot of my business, right? Um, but I'm sorry, what, what are the brands? I'm going to ask you. I feel yeah, like I'm okay. super I, intrigued. One, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you in one second, but I was just going to say that when he was asking me like how I found success in fitness, the real answer to that was, well, it wasn't because I did squats better than anybody else, or I lunged deeper than anyone else, because anyone can like do that. But it was the fact that I was so tenacious and persistent that I just never gave up. Like I was definitely not the most talented fitness person by by any stretch, but I kept on getting these like major opportunities that nobody else was getting that were way better than I was. Like they were more talented than me. They were prettier than me. They were fitter than me. But yet I was getting these major Nike deals and I was getting all these big spokes. Like I was on the cover of tons of different magazines, not because I was like, my ass was any better than that girl's, but because I worked it and I was so bold and I was so tenacious that I just put myself in places I didn't belong over and over and over again. And I just wouldn't give up. And I never, ever thought that that person was better than me or they deserve it more than me. I would always walk into a situation with like, well, why not me? If they can do it, I can do it. I love that you say that because it's just like even the story that you said, like you you literally just said, oh, I'm putting myself in places I didn't belong. But you did belong because you were there. It's the story you told yourself for a little moment that someone else has a better ass, so they belong more than you do. Right, like... But that's just a story. Right, and also, like, in life, it's never the most talented or the prettiest or the or the smartest that wins. It's the people that, like, really, like, work really hard. And so I know people who are big into manifestation and visualization mm-hmm. may not like that, but it's the truth. It's really about putting in the hard work, not giving up, learning the skill of resilience... When you fall, get right back up, dust yourself off, try again and again and again. Mm. And so I mastered this thing that I talk about, which is this 10% target. So my like, all of this comes down to this big mindset shift, which is make 10 attempts at whatever you want most. And you may not get to that goal, but by doing that process, another opportunity will present itself that you never even knew existed because mm. nobody makes 10 attempts mostly nobody even makes one attempt. So if you're someone who's making two or three or four, your your chances of success are so much higher than anybody else's. And surround yourself with people who actually do those attempts. So from my experience, I resonate with everything you're saying so much because I... uh, um, I was very scared to start, start skydiving. I was terrified. I was oh, like, there's no way on the planet I can so do that. So scary. Yeah, I couldn't even look at like people skydiving, but my fiance is a skydiver. And I was like, oh no, this is like a universe's joke <laughs> on me. And so, like, he's start- a sky, like for a career, he's a skydiver? Uh, like, half professionally, yeah, because he has like 600 jumps. So I was like, <sighs> okay, like I will try once. And he's like, no, you need to tr- uh, try 24 times to finish your license. To do it, I was like, no, I can try once. He's like, you will hate it and you're going to feel absolutely uncoordinated. You're not going to enjoy it because you're not very good at it and you will give up. And he's like, please finish your license, which is 24 tries. And obviously, sure enough, the first few attempts hated it, right? I was like, this is this sucks. This is miserable. I'm scared. After 24 jumps, 
I loved it. I was like, oh, I know what's going on. I have now almost 400 jumps. And it's like, I'm actually good at this. Hold on. From someone who couldn't even watch a video of skydiving because I was that terrified. How so, did you get over the initial, because like jumping out of a plane, to be honest, is my biggest fear in oh, life. That's literally where I was. I was like, there's, you can over my dead body, literally. And yeah. so for me to even the first jump, you, you're on your own. So you have an instructor with you holding your hand, but like you're essentially on your own. You're not strapped to anybody. You still have to put, you know, uh, on your do, own, do you, yeah. you did like can't you go and be attached to somebody? You can, but if you want to do your license, there's you just have to do it on your own. So, so they the hold your hand. You jump out. He's holding onto your parachute. He's checking if you're like conscious, if you're doing these special moves, and you have to pull your parachute and then land on your own. What if it doesn't open? Well, that's an emergency. You have a second one. You always have a second one in skydiving, but it's like there's so many things can go wrong. But like what? Besides the fact that it won't open. Line twist. So it would like you would start spinning down and can, you know. So how do you, how do you. Or your parachute ha might have a hole or they're uneven. I mean, there's a million other things. You can hit other people, uh, which is like the most common one, how people die. But the, or landing. Landing is the most dangerous because you're going really, really fast towards the ground. Long story short, I was able to go from a person who was the most fearful to the boldest I'm like, wow, you're jumping out of a plane, 400 jumps. And I'm like, yep. That's, I'm like, I'm impressed with you. <laughs> that is crazy. 400? Mm -hmm. How high? Uh, 13,000 feet, you know. And so, <sighs> but I, without knowing, I used your, your technique of like, I'm going to do multiple attempts. And I know that the first few, I'll suck and I'm going to hate it. And I did. And now I freaking love it. And you should see me in the sky. I can do so many other things. And I'm like, wow, if I gave up after those two, three, four jumps, I would not allow myself to have a most beautiful hobby, like one of the most amazing experiences of my life, hands down. So like your message truly, truly resonates with me. I love that. And I that's the kind of like, that's why I, I wrote the book, because I want people to really, like really know that they cannot give up on themselves. So there's so much rejection in the world, right? And why self-reject? Like there, you're going to be rejected anyway. Ooh, Don't reject, so right? Like why reject yourself? And so I just want people to know that. And I really like have like a deep passion for that because I to, to kind of roll back to what you were asking me earlier. What I will tell you is, I wanted people to know that they didn't have to be perfect to be to get to what to, to get to where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. They just had to do it over and over again. They didn't have to be the best. They didn't have like don't didn't they didn't have to allow their self doubt to create or not create whatever they want in their head to get. Like I just didn't think that that was enough of an excuse. Like my I, my first business was called No Gym Required, by the way, and. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and it was literally like the, my my slogan was anytime, anywhere, no excuses. Like, I don't want to hear the fact that you don't go to a gym as a reason why you're not taking care of your health or your fitness, because you don't like the gym is one way to do it. Why can't you stay at home and do push-ups or squats or use laundry detergent? And I would do, I would basically create workouts using um, like home equipment, like using your, your coffee table, using your chair, using laundry detergents. And I would do like well, all these workouts. You must have annoyed so many people because they had no excuse anymore. They had no, no excuse. And I was like, damn it. Well, they were. <laughs> In fact, actually, I wanted, so I was the first person to use that, to, like that whole no gym required as like a, a slogan. And then like, I wanted to, I wanted to trademark it. And my lawyer was like, you can't trademark it because of this reason. And that gave me a, a whole plethora of reasons why I couldn't do it. And I'm like, but why? Like I was, no one else was like now everyone and their dog is using like that, mm -hmm. that expression and saying, and after a while, all these magazines would come out with like their no gym required workout or like no gym required. Like I even had a shoe called no gym required before anybody else, which was like, this weighted midsole that burned no. more calories. Yes. And so I created all of these things under my brand, No Gym Required, that would give people this way of working out without using a gym. And 
using this weighted midsole in their shoe, you would burn 25% more calories because of the extra resistance. And if you use like a, you know, one of your like pedometers or whatever, you calorie counters, whatever you'd see, you would actually see a minimum of 20%, like 25% more calories being burnt when using that weighted midsole. So Ooh, that, I love everything because for yeah. me, it's just like, it's really beautiful that obviously as a business personal entrepreneur, like create a business over someone's problem, but more so you just nail down someone's excuses and like ask yourself, yep. what are the excuses that I'm telling myself about me not going to the gym? Why am I telling myself that I can't do X, Y, and Z? Okay. These three things, I'm going to go after each one of them and prove them that they're not true. Absolutely. And deep down, it's not because I don't have the gym or I can't afford the gym. It's because I'm actually not doing it. You don't want to do it. Right. And like, what people would what people would normally do the psychology of it my background is my my first degree is in psychology i was very, uh, i was uh, i was <laughs> always very i i still am i'm fascinated by human nature and human psychology and why people do what they do and why they don't do what they do mm-hmm. always like that drives every business every everything i do and i know that like people will find any excuse in the book not to do something because they'd rather be comfortable and make it easy for themselves than to put themselves outside of that outside of that box, right? So if I eliminate the excuse for, well, then don't go to the gym. Just you you gotta wear shoes anyway. So put on these shoes. I'll help you a bit more. Mm. Or well, you know, you have to be home. Well, at least you can do like you can do some push-ups or you can do some step ups on this table or you can do uh, squats while you're waiting for your, uh, breakfast to be made. Like I would create these like situations where people really had no excuse not to move their body. And that was my, that was the, that was like the reason why I started the company Mm -hmm. and why I did the shoes. And that was, and that was like, I was basically like doing that for a long time. And then I sold the shoe company to a a different brand and they kind of didn't do much with them. In fact, I want to get that. I'm putting it out here right now. I'm trying, I want to get that back and I want to put those shoes out again because I think that is something that is so, it's like, it, it's so needed today. Like people are all mm-hmm. wearing those, those vests, those weighted vests when they go on these walks now. Right. But it's kind of clunky and it's kind yeah. of like uncomfortable. Why not wear the shoes? Yeah. Right. So there's that. And then I did another thing. I wrote another book. My first book was called No Gym Required, but my second book was called Strong is the New Skinny because everybody could be strong. Not everyone could be skinny because skinny Mm -hmm. can be a body type, right? Like you can only get so far if you are built a certain way. Mm -hmm. So go for a goal that's actually very viable and easy to get. Like we can all get stronger. We can all be strong. We don't, so don't focus on the skinny, focus on the strong. So that was my second book. Plus, strong is so much healthier for you anyways. And sexier, in my opinion, but that's beside yes. the point. Like, who wants a wimp? I don't know. But I guess, like, you know, <laughs> I rather, like, I think se- I think women who are, like, strong and sexy, like, are sexier, yeah. oh, personally. I think, and, and healthier, right? So, like, the more muscle you have, the, you know, the it is easier for you to even be skinny. Yeah, like but that. you know what the truth is? Psychology is... Women are doing it because they want to look better. Mm. They're not doing it. I mean, now may be different. I mean, now it's evolved and changed. And as we get older, we want to be healthier. But when you're young, your motivation is vanity. You're like, I want to look better. I want to have a six pack. I want to do this. I want to have a tight ass. Let's be honest. That's what most women and why most women are exercising, especially when you're young, when you're, when you are in your twenties, they can, everyone can say all the nice, you know, PC commentaries, Mm -hmm. but that's why, and by the way, men too, men are working out because they want to be fit. They want to be strong. They want to have a big chest. They forget about their legs most of their time, most of the time, but guys want to feel powerful, big, manly. That's, that's the number one driving, motivating reason. And then once you master that to a certain place, you're like, okay, I also want to be healthy. I want, I also want to do this. I also want to do that. But the first thing to get people to actually do the thing is to focus on the physicality of that. I mean, that is just being totally straight up with you. And so then 
I developed a company called Hot Five, which were a bu bunch of hot people working out for five minutes. And that was sold to Weight Watchers. On the way. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. You have like so many ideas. <laughs> I love it. So actually, it's so funny because my final question would be actually about the power of community. I know you're like a master, um, like the queen of your community. And you know, so many people in LA and so many people in LA know you. And um, you're quite like, famous right and it's like I want to talk about the connection about being bolder calling in the right people in the life how some of the things in life will happen through knowing the right people and just letting them help you in a way and the power of the community and how is that connected to fitness so what's really interesting is that was never um it, it, it was never strat like I never really go into something with that idea like I really believe it all comes from authenticity I think that what happens is I'm very, I think I'm pretty authentic and real. There's no bullshit. There's no filter. I say what I think. Um, I act the way I feel. And I think that people like the right, some, some people don't like it because it makes them uncomfortable. But for the most part, my people, the people that I will gravitate to will gravitate to that as well. And I think that people appreciate people where there's no bullshit. Like you, what you see is what you get. You know mm -hmm. exactly where you stand with me. You know exactly how I, how I feel about something. I think LA is a really, especially LA is yeah. a place <laughs> where people just like bullshit you all the time and they'll tell you what you want to hear and they will blow sunshine up your butt because that's what way more comfortable for them. And I just don't fall into that. I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm not that person. And I think actually growing up the way I did, where I grew up, I'm from Canada and I'm from a place called, I'm, I'm from Winnipeg, you know, like. I know where that is actually. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, there you go. Yeah, I had a friend who was from there. Really? Yeah. Well, I think that then your friend must be a really good person and a nice person <laughs> because I just think that like, I, I, I kind of was, I grew up and I have a, I have a pretty good head on my shoulders. And when I moved to L.A., I think right away you stand out when you come from a place that's different uh, with other people like that was because so much of that is happening that when someone finds somebody who's actually like a real person, it's like a breath of fresh air. Mm. And so I think that like worked to my advantage. And then I'm also somebody that I, I do what I say and I say what I do. And so follow through is very, very important to me. I think if you don't have that, like you, you basically have nothing, you know, like I, I am not somebody who I don't, I hate flaky people. I hate people who make a lot of promises and then don't deliver. And so I try to be, Oh, you must really struggle in LA. <laughs> I do. I, but at the, I do. I will, I will say that like, I try to be the person that I want other people to be, not just want other people to be that way and then not do that myself. Yeah. And in that in that process, you do, you meet a lot of frogs, but then you also once in a while meet some nice princes and princesses Aww. and, you know, and then like, that's how you build a real community. And I think when you show up being yourself and being authentic and being real and, and bolder and bolder for sure <laughs> and bold, you will find, like, you will find that. Like my mom would always say to me, like two things, you'd say like every pot has a lid, right? Mm -hmm. And that like water finds its level. And I believe those things to be true. Like not everybody is for everybody and mm -hmm. that's okay. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be my best friend and I don't have to be your best friend, right? Like we may just not like be each other's thing, right? As long as I'm polite and cordial and you're polite and cordial, whatever, but you can just keep it moving. But I think like if you're a real person and you just are showing up like really genuinely who you are, you will find a great community anywhere, yeah. LA, Timbuktu, Beijing, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And I also am not, I, I've, I've, I think you need to master the skill of curiosity. Mm. I think when you're really curious and you are interested, not just interesting, but interested, that's how you find opportunity and communication starts and happenings and you talk to people and learn about them. That to me is like how, how all of this, how you build a community, how you find business opportunities, how you find 
romantic loves. I mean, like mm-hmm. have some, like, build on your curiosity, your baseline, right? Like if your yeah. baseline of curiosity is a two, at least get it to a three or a four or a five. Beautiful. Jennifer, where can people find you and where can they get the book? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, they can get the book on Amazon, wherever books are sell, you know, Barnes and Noble, wherever. Uh, and they can find me on Instagram with the real Jen Cohen. They can go to jennifercohen.com and sign up for my newsletter and find out how they could be bolder in their life and ask for what they want. And, um, all the things that like they can listen to my podcast habits and hustle. I, I was going to say, I was gonna say <laughs> I didn't even talk about that habits and hustle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you for, for like encouraging people to live their best life and clearly starting a lot of fitness trends in the industry. It's so oh, lovely to you. finally meet you guys. B- uh, bigger, better, bolder. Now available on Amazon. Make sure you follow Jennifer and lots of love. I'll see you in the next episode.